Hello, I'm Emily Hawthorne, a Middle East and North Africa analyst at Stratfor, a RAIN company. This podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, RAIN's premier digital publication for objective geopolitical intelligence and analyses. Sign up for the free Stratfor newsletter at worldview.stratfor.com. You're listening to the Stratfor Essential Geopolitics Podcast from RAIN. I'm Emily Donahue. The attack happened on Mother's Day weekend in the U.S. By May 12th, a few days later, the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack was having a major impact on fuel supplies to the East Coast. The historic attack disrupted more than just fuel supplies. I'm joined by Stratfor Senior Global Analyst at RAIN, Matthew Bay. Hey, Matthew. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. Listen, can we start with the basics here? Fuel shortages seem to be very tangible results. How significant is the cyber attack against the Colonial Pipeline compared to other incidents that we've seen? So this is clearly the most um, significant cyber attack that we have seen against the U.S. energy sector. Um, if you just look at the, the shortages that we're now seeing in the southeast of the United States, um, in the metro areas and areas in North Carolina, a lot of the gas stations just simply do not have gas. Um, estimates are that between 60 and 75 percent um, do not have, uh, have have gasoline. Um, and we're seeing similar stories throughout the southeast, uh, the rest of the southeast, um, where outages can range somewhere in the 50 percent, leading to fuel queues, things like that. Um, just to put it into perspective, the 2.5 million barrels per day um, that the Colonial Pipeline can transport, that's roughly half of what the East Coast consumes. Um, so it's a very significant outage. It's something that we really haven't seen outside of um, very localized short-term incidents that are related to, for example, a hurricane or something like that. But this is obviously a much bigger deal um, when you're talking about, you know, seven or eight states being affected in a significant fashion. Having lived through some of those short-term outages, I can say that the lack of fuel demonstrates what a finely tuned system there is to keep the fuel pumps flowing. Can we talk a little bit about the implications of this attack? Yeah, so um, once the pipeline is back in service, we're probably not going to see um, any major long-lasting implications to the to the oil and gas sector itself. Um, that said, of course, uh, Colonial Pipeline and other pipeline companies, etc., um, are going to be looking at ways at boosting cyber defenses so that this doesn't happen. Um, more broadly, there is a question as to how this will shape the, the Biden agenda towards cybersecurity. Already, the Biden administration has been dealing with um, two major cyber incidents. There's, of course, the, the Russia-linked solar winds hack that happened at the end of last year. And then earlier this year, there was the China-linked um, Microsoft Exchange hack. This adds another cyber attack that is clearly more visible. It's having much more of a tangible impact than the other cyber attacks. And that's going to um, bring a lot more pressure on Biden to, to go big when we talk about cyber reforms. The Biden administration has been working on an executive order that aims to boost cyber defenses, but the way that it was designed, it was designed in the wake of the SolarWinds and Microsoft Exchange hacks, which were um, attacks that were basically finding vulnerabilities in software that companies use and using that as a vector to get into a lot, thousands of companies' systems. Um, the attack that we saw on the Colonial Pipeline is a little bit different. It's a ransomware attack that really wasn't going in through a supply chain hack. Um, therefore, the kinds of ways that the government would want to, I guess, put into place measures to prevent these kinds of attacks from happening, or at least limiting the likelihood, is likely going to require something else than what was originally included in the executive order that they're drafting. The executive order um, does things like um, it will set up new data security standards for, for government contractors to follow. Since a lot of that is actually going to be done from the government's point of view, it may not necessarily be directly transferable to a private company. And a lot of the critical infrastructure in the U.S. is owned by private companies, not the government. So those kinds of moves may not necessarily uh, trickle down and impact um, cybersecurity standards um, directly that, um, say, Colonial Pipeline might have to, to have to implement. Therefore, we're likely to see the executive order or at the very least some follow-up executive order um, expanding the scope of what the Biden administration originally intended for. Matthew, the previous ones that you mentioned were nation-state attacks. What can you tell us about the group or software behind this attack? Right. So this attack appears to be using software that's done, uh, that was organized by um, DarkSide. It's an Eastern European group that is a basically a ransomware for hire type of a service. What they essentially do, um, have they've developed ransomware tools. They boast that they their, their ransomware can encrypt 
um, data faster than any other competitor. And essentially what they try to do is then offer their services or their software to, to partner with what they call affiliates. Um, and those affiliates can then, you know, target whomever they want to in a ransomware attack with the intent on making money. What's been kind of interesting about the reaction here is that, that DarkSide um, put out a press release after this was kind of unveiled saying that um, they are out there to make money. They're not a geopolitical entity and they aren't really trying to take down or have a big social impact um, on things like hacking a, a major pipeline. So they are trying to, in some ways, distance themselves from, from the actual incident and they are saying that they will now um, put into place more moderations in terms of the impact on on um, what would happen if any of their ransomware is used in other attacks that other of their affiliates, so-called affiliates, um, were to actually carry out. Of course, at the end of the day, these are cyber criminals, so we kind of, you know, take their take their uh, intent with a grain of salt when it comes to saying they won't target these kinds of entities in the future. But they are a, uh, DarkSide is a ransomware as a service kind of hacking group, and, and they have become quite active when it comes to selling their services. And we're likely to see this, this ransomware as a service kind of a tactic continue to evolve, continue to be more sophisticated, and continue to be a, a major problem, not just for critical infrastructure um, in the United States, but more broadly, just firms globally that are um, that have the ability, and in some cases do pay, um, you know, ransomware demands that can, in some cases, approach, you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars. Matthew, for years we've been warned that the United States infrastructure is open to these kind of attacks. How do you think that the Biden administration will respond to this kind of thing? So the Biden administration will definitely put into place more requirements around government and um, company cooperation when it comes to the reaction to these kinds of cyber attacks. I mean, we have to be realistic. You're absolutely right. The the U.S. critical infrastructure and U.S. companies are going to be attacked um, and have been you know, saying for years that they're going to be attacked um, in the future when it comes to these kinds of things. There's really no way to fully prevent the, the ability of a cyber attack actually happening. Um, for example, this cyber attack wasn't something that actually targeted the pipeline itself. Rather, it targeted the IT systems of the company, and then that required them or led them to um, shutting down the pipeline because, for example, they may not necessarily have access to the billing and things like that that they can do that's all, all going to be on their normal network and not the actual network that's running the pipeline. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that that's going to mean that really what the Biden administration can do is yes, they can put into place more requirements around data security or login security, credential authentication, things like that. But putting into place a reaction plan um, and how to mitigate um, any of the long-term impacts of a cyber attack, that's kind of what's going to be a significant issue here. Putting out the pipeline audit service for a couple of days may not have had the same kind of an impact when it comes to the fuel shortages. Um, we're now looking at an outage for the pipeline that could last at least a week that's having a more significant impact. So I think that what we're going to see is some reforms that are around how do you respond to the cyber attack once it happens on a critical infrastructure and how do you get those systems up and running as fast as possible? Um, because at the end of the day, yes, you can put it into more place, more cyber defenses, and yes, the Biden administration will put into place uh, more requirements around that and also try to work with the private sector to do that. However, at the end of the day, we're talking about an area where Cyber offense is often, you know, leaps and bounds ahead of cyber defense when it comes to trying to figure out vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Um, so you can never really put into place a system that will prevent um, these kinds of attacks from happening. And so I think what we're going to be seeing just in terms of the, the, the bigger impact to the U.S. fuel supplies is really, you know, how do you respond? How do you put into place a, a way to uh, ensure that once you if you do suffer a major attack on your infrastructure, how do you respond quickly to mitigate and minimize any of the longer lasting impacts to what we're seeing now around like, you know, fuel shortages? Thanks, Matthew, for that guidance. There's a lot more online at Worldview, of course. Thank you. Matthew Bay is Stratfor Senior Global Analyst at Rain. Guiding our clients with intelligence on cybersecurity is one of Stratfor and Rain's core areas of expertise. If you like what you heard today, sign up for the free Stratfor Worldview newsletter from Rain. Sign up at worldview.stratfor.com. That's worldview.stratfor.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening.